Hello everybody, my name's Annabelle and today I'll be talking about the history of children and the value of the life of a child and how that's changed over time. Now, obviously I will be talking about dead children and that is something pretty heavy and disturbing that some of you may not want to hear about and that's totally fine. And if that's the case, please click off this video. But uh, without further ado, let's get into it. Towards the end of the 19th century, there were a number of wrongful death cases for children. In 1896, for example, the parents of a two-year-old killed due to the negligence of the Southern Railway Company of Georgia received nothing beyond the cost of a burial. As the judge said, the child was of such tender years as to be unable to have any earning capacity and hence the defendant could not be held liable in damages. Other compensations at the time included six cents for a New York boy, $10 for a three-year-old in Nebraska, one cent for a 12-year-old in Missouri, and an eight-year-old boy was compensated with $50 in 1895, which was estimated at the time to be about the cost of a healthy poodle dog. What the hell? <laughs> in contrast, children today are seen as the most precious members of society. They're treasured, invested in, and kept alive at all costs. And this is reflected by more modern compensation cases. For example, in 1975, the parents of a child killed by fluoride poisoning at the dentist were compensated with $750,000. This obviously wasn't related to the child's earning capacity. This was related to the emotional damages, and things have continued in this fashion. Today, wrongful child death cases can garner up to $4 million. And beyond financial statistics, it's obvious that children are treasured. Parents today devote huge portions of their resources, time, emotional energy, money, to keeping their children safe and happy. So why has the value of a child's life changed so much over time? And what are some of the interesting behaviors and customs that surrounded children back in the day when their lives were worth a very different amount? Well, to answer the changing value of a child's life question, children are more likely to survive than they ever have throughout the entirety of history. And so they're a better investment, which sounds really kind of cold, but it's true. In the pre-industrial age, about one in every four children would die before they reached the age of one. And it's estimated that about half of all children would die before they hit puberty. The reason we think this, even though there were no formal censuses back in the day, is that population growth was extremely slow, yet the birth rate was very high. Children are very vulnerable. They're particularly susceptible to things like diarrhea and pneumonia, and often children are born with congenital abnormalities that need to be fixed in a hospital. So back in the day when there were no hospitals, often these children would die within the first few days, months or years of life. And with the exception of, of course, wars, famine and epidemics, epidemics, child mortality has decreased pretty steadily over time. But even in 1920, which doesn't seem all that long ago, one in every three children were estimated to have died globally before the age of five. That figure has dropped significantly to just 3.5%, which of course is higher in some countries and lower in others. And of course, there are still places where too many children die, but it is a vast improvement. But it does beg the question, if you are facing a one in four, one in three, or even 50-50 chance that your child will die before they reach adulthood, how would you deal with this? And what are some historical markers that give us clues as to how people coped with child death back in the day? Well, our first clue is names. According to historian Amy Catalano, naming practices are not random, but instead conform to deeper cultural rules. And thus, they're helpful in telling us things about the situation a child was born into. For example, if a kid is named after a compass point, they're most likely a Kardashian. And if a kid is named like Rainbow Tofu or something, they're definitely from Byron Bay. And so naming practices throughout history can give us clues as to attitudes towards child mortality. In the ancient world, for example, delayed naming was fairly common. And perhaps this was a technique to prevent excessive bonding with offspring that may not survive. The ancient Romans didn't name their children for up to a week after they were born. And some Native American tribes didn't name their children until the age of five or ten 
referring to them simply as little one. It was also common for Incan children to be given a temporary name until puberty where they would be bestowed with a permanent one. Even in early colonial America, there was a tendency to put off naming children until they were a few months old. And this gave way to lots of gravestones with inscriptions such as little one or baby, which indicates that the child didn't yet have real name. According to historian Amy Catalano, this withholding of names told of the cognizance that children may be living on borrowed time. As time went on, it became more common for infants to be named at or shortly after birth, but there were still some trends that told of child mortality. One particularly interesting one is the phenomenon of replacement naming. It was so common for children to die in early modern Europe and colonial America that often families would simply try again. They'd have another little Bob or Jean-Claude or Gary. By naming a second child after the first one, I think the theory was that hopefully the deceased child would live on through their sibling. And if they didn't have a child of the same gender, often a gender flipped version of the deceased child named would be given to the new sibling. For example, Frank would become Francesca or Chris would become Christina. And many celebrities from the past were actually replacement children. For example, Napoleon was named after Napoleon, who died when he was four. Vincent van Gogh was named after his sibling Vincent van Gogh, who died a year before his birth. And these replacement names are so common that I thought I'd do a little experiment and I thought, who is famous from the past? Okay, Charles Dickens. And so I went on I went on Google and I looked up Charles Dickens and, and actually his family has a pretty good survival rate. Not many people died. But if you look at Charles Dickens' siblings, you can see that his brother Alfred Dickens died at birth in 1814 and was then replaced by the next Alfred Dickens in 1822. And this practice speaks volumes about the attitudes of parents towards their children at the time. It says that although these children are dearly loved and mourned, they're not seen as the permanent and irreplaceable things they are today. They have a slightly different sense of individuality, and this is reflected in the replacement naming practice. It makes me think what it would have been like to be the second Alfred or the second Vincent or the second Napoleon and what this would have done to these people's minds. There is research on subsequent or replacement siblings of children who have died, and it's colloquially, colloquially I can't say that. There's, there's even a phenomenon named replacement child syndrome in which subsequent children feel inadequate and struggle to live up to their deceased sibling or struggle with survivor's guilt. Researchers Kane and Kane describe this struggle. Amidst the guilt-laden, inexpressible rage aroused in the substitute child by incessant comparison with its invincible dead rival, the child was asked not only to mourn but even to join in the idealization of his competitor. And to be honest, I have no doubt, even in the past when it was more common to lose a child and name children after their siblings, this must have been hard for the surviving children. Unfortunately, we don't have a ton of research on the subject. It is known, however, that Vincent van Gogh had to walk past the grave of his deceased brother with his name on it every day on his way to school. And it does make you think, what would this have done to his mind? Although delayed naming and replacement naming were the most common child mortality related naming practices, there have also been some other interesting naming examples going on throughout history. For example, uh, the death names of Uganda. In colonial Uganda, things were pretty bad. There was a widespread exploitation of the Ugandan people. There was famine. There was also from 1900 to 1910, a sleeping sickness epidemic that killed 250,000 people. Many of these people were children and therefore childhood mortality was at an all time high. Examining the baptismal records of the Bunyoro Society in Western Uganda, researcher Shane Doyle found that nearly one third of names given during the colonial period referred to death in some way such as Nyamaro, which means children are meant for death, or Nakafuka, which means I am the only survivor. And more than this, over 10% of names given signified a belief that the child would die, such as Nodoriere, which means I'm waiting to see what happens, Bagada, which means what a, what a waste of energy, or Bietika, which means this child belongs to the soil. And looking at these names, it's easy to assume that Ugandan parents were worn down and depressed by 
the higher levels of childhood mortality, which I'm sure is the case. But Shane Doyle also says that Ugandan names had a different function at, than Western names. They worked sort of like a news bulletin to let people know what was going on and to describe the surroundings into which a child was born. More than this, names in colonial Uganda tended to be individualized. That is made up for each child and often describing the goings on in the world around the child like a news bulletin. For example, naming a child Barungidoho, which means they are nice to my face, could be a way of letting friends and neighbours know that the parents know that there's a traitor in the midst. Also in Ugandan culture, at least at the time, death was believed to be rather than just something that happens to you, a malicious force that can think and, and goes out of its way to hurt people. Therefore, perhaps some of these death names were a way of feigning indifference to outsmart death itself. After the sleeping sickness and famine subsided, child outcomes started to improve and these death names went out of vogue. They didn't come back in the 1980s and 90s during the AIDS epidemic either. But they were an interesting clue to Ugandan people's attitudes towards child death in the early 18th century. In the modern world, things are very different. Children are overall much less likely to die and they tend to be given names very quickly after birth or even before they're born. Although it's not uncommon for a child to be named but after an aunt or an uncle or a grandparent, they're almost never given the same name as their sibling, especially not their deceased sibling. Now naming practices, at least in affluent Western society, tend to be focused on individualism and parents tend not to want too many children to have the same name as their child. Sam. Great, Sam. Uncle Sam, I want you. Which is a clear indication of how unlikely children in these circumstances are to die. Parents see every child as a precious individual who is likely to last well into adulthood. However, names are not the only clues as to the evolution of the worth of the life of a child throughout history. Another indicator is behaviors that surround child death and mourning practices. One of the first pieces of evidence we have about parental mourning practices was the ancient Greek philosopher Plutarch's letter to his wife after the death of their two-year-old child. In this letter, he implores his wife not to mourn too much, although he acknowledges the tragedy that has occurred. This is very much in line with the customs of the time in which mourning for children under the age of three was in fact banned. This indicates that young children are less of a loss than an adult, even if they were dearly loved by their parents. This theme of withholding mourning for children continues throughout history and across many cultures. For example, in 19th century Korea, in addition to the instructions for mourning dress and sacrifice, parents and grandparents were expected to mourn children who are also divided into age classes, one degree less than for adults. Uh, for those under eight years of age, no mourning garments were worn, and for a baby under three months, there's not even wailing. Even in 1851, where Charles Dickens is, I know Charles Dickens is getting a bit of a, he's getting a bit of a revisit. When Charles Dickens' daughter Dora Ann passed away at the age of eight months, he wrote to his wife Catherine, imploring her to do what is right and to not mourn excessively for the sake of the other children. Um, basically, he told her to keep it together, which she, she did not. She suffer terrible mental health problems, understandably. Essentially, up until the mid-Victorian era, it was seen as excessive to mourn an infant's death, at least publicly. But then with the emergence of the middle class, parental mourning for children started to change. Childhood was a time of innocence and indulgence. Around this time, it also became increasingly acceptable to mourn one's deceased children. This had some manifestations which today uh, may seem quite quite sweet and, and uh, pretty mild, but also some which today may seem odd. On the more sedate end, mothers would make memorial quilts for their deceased children and carry around lockets of their hair, which was actually quite beautiful. But on the stranger end was the phenomenon of memorial photography. Memorial photographs were pictures of the dead, often kept in lockets along with the lock of their hair. Oftentimes it was the only picture ever taken of the person and it was often taken after their death. Memorial photography was an art form in itself and like most art forms there was various fashions and styles. In some photographs the deceased was portrayed as peacefully sleeping, 
In others, they were portrayed at the moment of death, surrounded by medicine bottles and perhaps even a stethoscope borrowed from the doctor to indicate the parents' attempts to save them. Perhaps to modern taste, the strangest of all was the memorial photography in which the deceased was portrayed as alive. Their eyes were either painted open after the photograph was taken or propped open, and they were propped up as if they were still living. Um, These photographs, I invite you to Google them with caution as viewing from the lens of someone today. Um, They look pretty haunting. And strangely, a really good way to tell if someone is dead in a photograph is to look at whether they're perfectly in focus or not. Back in the Victorian era, an average photograph had an exposure time of about 15 minutes. And during this exposure time, you needed to stay exactly still. Otherwise, the photograph would end up looking a bit blurry. Something as small as breathing could interfere with this, this exposure process. So Almost everyone in a Victorian photograph is is slightly, slightly blurry. However, if you look at these photographs, these memorial photographs, the deceased is not breathing and therefore is completely still. So they tend to be completely in focus while the living people around them are a little bit out of focus, a little bit blurry, which is even more creepy. But yes, memorial photography was a huge industry and while it may seem kind of creepy to us today and the photographs do look undeniably haunting, it was an indication of people's love for their deceased children and their need to memorialize the people that they had lost. These days in the Western world, child mortality is so low that to be honest, I've never even thought about child mourning practices for children. It's not something that I've ever really been forced to consider, thank God. I do know that babies who are stillborn are often photographed and memorialized that way. I also know that child cemeteries often have playgrounds and things like that. Um, Terminally ill children are given opportunities to live out their wishes through charity. The rarity of child death has given us the resources to really mourn the lives of children. In the past, it was quite common for a child to die, but now it is considered exceptionally rare and unusual. And we as a society take more steps to make sure that the life of a child, no matter how short, is honored and celebrated. We also recognize the importance of providing a safe and healthy environment for children And we are more dedicated to protecting their rights and well-being than ever before. For the final section of this video, I would like to present a bit of a case study. This case study focuses on how extreme poverty, high infant mortality and high birth rates can lead to very specific attitudes towards infant death. This is the case study of the angel babies of the Alto in Brazil. The Alto is a village in the sugar plantation zone of Pernambuco. It was in 1992 when biological anthropologist Nancy Shepper Hugh wrote her book, Death Without Weeping, A Place of Extreme, Extreme Poverty. It was a place of mass starvation and very limited medical resources. The people at the time lived in huts without sanitation or running water and survived on very small amounts of food. Also, mothers tended to depend on powdered milk to feed their babies rather than breast milk as they were so malnourished themselves. They didn't want to deplete their already stretched bodies. Because of the lack of resources and rampant disease, childhood mortality was extremely high. In Shepperhue's sample of three generations of mothers, the average woman had 9.5 pregnancies, eight births, and 3.5 infant deaths. This pattern is called a pre-demographic transition pattern. And this is one in which high fertility is driven by untamed infant and childhood mortality. This occurs because breastfeeding impedes for fertility. So it's much more difficult to get pregnant if you're already breastfeeding another baby, although not impossible. In this pattern, there tends to be limited or no access to birth control. And more than this, if your baby dies, you're more likely to try and have another one as a kind of replacement. And because of this high turnover of children, the mothers in the Alto on some level expected their children to die. And this shaped their maternal attachment. According to Shepard Hugh, the mothers of the Alto loved their children with great intensity. But their love grew as the babies became stronger and older and established themselves more permanently on the earth. Babies who died were not really mourned. Mothers wouldn't shed tears for a deceased baby and funerals were not really much of a thing. Shepper Hughes writes that infant death was so commonplace that I recall a birthday party for a four-year-old in which the birthday cake decorated with candles was placed on the kitchen table next to the tiny blue cardboard coffin of the child's nine-month-old sibling who had died during the night. Next to the coffin, a single vigil candle was lit. 
Despite the tragedy, the child's mother wanted to go ahead with the party. This preference for older, surviving, stronger children was also shown in the religious iconography of the Alto. The statues of the Virgin Mary were not depicted holding the baby Jesus, but instead holding the adult Jesus after his crucifixion. What's most interesting about the mothers of the Alto is not necessarily their lack of mourning for their babies, but the phenomenon of the angel babies, which was the name given to babies who were failing to thrive and who did not display a gusto for life. These babies, Nancy Shepherd Hughes writes, were kept at arm's length by their mothers and were often kind of nudged towards death with a gradual withholding of resources. And it makes sense that if you can barely feed yourself and your other more likely to live children, why devote time, emotional and physical energy and food to a child who will probably die? Even when external bodies came in and offered things such as medicine and, and Coca-Cola to help a dehydrated baby, often the mothers would refuse. They believed the angel babies were destined for heaven and did not want to interfere with that process. Shepherd Hughes writes that sometimes the angel babies did turn a corner and a child that was very sickly would begin to show strength and stubbornness and hold on to life. Apparently these babies were valued above all else and the mothers would cry for the babies who did survive over those who died. Thankfully things in this region has much improved and from 2013 most families will only have two to three children and the vast majority of these children will survive but it is an interesting and really sad and really recent example of what has happened for most of history high mortality rates and high birth rates and the accompanying attitudes that we develop to cope with this phenomenon in conclusion for most of history children have been relatively likely to die and this has had an impact on our attitudes towards their worth as well as our behavior. This has been manifested through naming, burial customs, and even sometimes required us to ration our resources. There are today still places where children are very vulnerable and where childhood mortality rates are still high. However, overall, children have never been more likely to survive to adulthood. And this is reflected in the worth of their lives, which, in the words of American Express, is priceless.